In this video, I'm going to walk you through um, covalent shapes and hybridization. So we're not switching gears here from covalent. All right, this still is going to be these um, sharing of electrons taking place between these atoms. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at here is called Vesper theory. Uh, it stands for valent shell electron pair repulsion. You never need to know what uh, the letters uh, stand for. You just need to know what it means. And basically what it says here is that the valence electrons will try to get as far apart as possible. Uh, in these covalent molecules, and sometimes this changes the 3D shape of the molecule, okay? So the valence electrons are trying to get as far apart as possible, and sometimes this leads to some 3D shapes taking place, all right? So a lot of molecules here are not two-dimensional, which basically means they're not flat. They're actually 3D, all right? So um, what happens here is, is that sometimes in these molecules, when you have unshared pairs of electrons, and we'll talk about what that means in a second, um, these unshared pairs of electrons are held closer uh, by your center atom, and this causes the bonding pairs to kind of repel, all right? And they repel from each other, and this creates sometimes these different shapes. Sometimes they're 3D, sometimes they're bent a little bit, all right? So the valence electrons try to get as far apart as possible, and sometimes this leads to some interesting shapes here for these covalent uh, compounds. So the difference here between bonding pairs of electrons and lone pairs. Bonding pairs are the electrons that are literally shared between the atoms. So these, when you're thinking of your dot structures, these would be the electrons that are in between the two atoms being shared. Those are bonding pairs. They form the bonds. All right. Lone pairs are electrons that are not involved with the bonds, but are there on a particular atom in order to make it happy, in order to reach that magic number of eight valence electrons. So we call those lone pairs. They're not directly involved with the bond, but they're needed in order to reach that magic number. All right, and a lot of times here, lone pairs will repel stronger than the bonding pairs. Okay, so if you look at these two pictures here, if you notice, each of these pictures both have a center atom. Over here on the left, it's pink. Over here on the right, it's orange. And they each have three things attached to the center. But if you notice, the one on the left is nice and flat, okay? But the one on the right kind of has this bent down shape to it. Kind of looks like a little alien spaceship. And this is all because one of them has lone pairs on the center atom and the other one doesn't. Okay, so having those lone pairs cause these atoms okay to kind of bend the electrons in the bonds kind of try to bend to get away um, from the lone pair of electrons so we'll look at this more now i'm going to walk you through a bunch of the different common molecular shapes that exist uh, these are pretty much a review from honors except there are a couple new ones here now that you are responsible for in ap so i'll kind of take my time through the first one and then we'll kind of uh, zoom a little faster as we go through. Uh, so the first one here is linear. Again, I'm going to give you just an example of a compound that has a linear uh, shape. And then you can see here the type is AB2, meaning typically you would have one element and then two of a second element if you were looking at the formula. Uh, bond angles for AP are a little bit more important. You do need to be able to identify some of these common bond angles and AP will ask questions about bond angles. Uh, sometimes they'll give you a little bit of a range. Uh, sometimes if it was something like this, they would totally expect that you would know like a bond angle for a linear would be 180. All right. But remember the key here in determining the shapes are the number of attached and the number of lone pairs on the center atom. So whenever you're trying to determine the molecular shape or molecular geometry of a molecule, draw it. Even if it doesn't uh, you know, tell you to do the dot structure, do the dot structure first, and then you analyze the dot structure to determine the shape. Don't try to guess. You do the dot structure, and then you determine the shape. So you always look at the center atom, all right? That's the important part. If you were to draw this shape right here and look at the center atom, you count how many things attached, how many lone pairs on the center. So if you look at this, the beryllium has two things attached, one, two, and then it has no lone pairs on the center. That's what makes this linear. All right, and then obviously because it's linear, it's a 180 bond angle. So you do need to know more of these bond angles for AP, and you need to be able to you know, draw a dot structure, look at the center, and determine what shape it'll be based on the number of attached and lone pairs on that center atom. 
So remember, this is the most important part for all the slides we're going to look at here, for all the shapes, and you got to look at the center atom and definitely know those bond angles for AP. This is a new shape for us in AP. Uh, it's another form of linear when you have two things attached, but you have three lone pairs on the center atom. All right, it still ends up being linear because of all those extra lone pairs on the center. Just being a 180 uh, kind of in a line makes the uh, valence electrons as far apart as possible. Uh, so you can see that here for XEF2. You can see if you look at the center, there are two things attached to the center and there are three lone pairs on the center atom. So this is just another form of linear and it's definitely a new one here for AP that you got to watch out for. Bent is a shape we looked at in honors. It's when you have two things attached to the center, two lone pairs on the center, or there's a version of bent where you could have two things attached and just one lone pair on the center. That would be another example of bent, so just watch out for that one. And the bond angle here is about 104.5. So you got to watch for this. It's okay if you knew it was around 104 or around 105. AP does allow for usually a little wiggle room here uh, if they would ask you for a bond angle of a bent shape, uh, but you should know it's around that 104, 105 bond angle for a bent shape. So two things attached to the center, two lone pairs on the center, or maybe just one makes the shape bent. Now we're getting into our shapes that have three things attached to the center atom. This one is trigonal planar. It ends up being nice and flat. All right, so you have three things attached to the center, zero lone pairs on the center. That makes this nice flat. We call it trigonal planar, and the bond angle would be 120 because you have three uh, bonds in a complete 360 circle. So 120 would be the bond angle. That's when you get the valence electrons trying to be as far apart as possible. All right, so three attached, zero lone pairs on the center, 120 bond angle, trigonal, trigonal planar, nice and flat. So now all we did for trigonal pyramidal is we just added a lone pair to the center. So you still have three attached, but now you have one lone pair on the center atom. So that makes it trigonal pyramidal here. All right. Instead of it being nice and flat uh, because of that lone pair on the center atom, the uh, electrons in the bond are bending down to get away from that extra lone pair. And this has a bond angle of about 107. Again, you do need to know uh, some of these common bond angles here for AP. All right, so three atoms attached uh, to the center, one lone pair on the center when you draw your shape. That's going to be trigonal pyramidal. It's not going to be flat, and it's going to have a 107, roughly 107 bond angle. T shaped is a new shape for AP. This is when you still have three attached to the center, but now you have two lone pairs on the center. All right, so you can see how all we did was we increased the number of lone pairs. We started with three attached, zero lone. Then we went to three attached, one lone. Now we're at three attached, two lone pairs. This is T-shaped. Uh, and it's going to have a couple bond angles depending on uh, what you're looking at. So not as important that you memorize like the bond angles for this one because you can kind of figure it out. Because of the shape, you can see that you know these two fluorine would have a 180 bond angle, but then like fluorine, chlorine here to this fluorine, that would only be a 90 degree bond angle, all right? It forms like a perfect T. So anytime you have three attached to the center, but two lone pairs on the center, it forms T-shaped. Now we're increasing to four attached. So tetrahedrals, when you have four attached to the center, zero lone pairs on the center, uh, it's not flat. If this was flat, they would all have that 90 degree bond angle, but we can get them further apart by thinking in terms of three dimension. So uh, in order to get these atoms and their valence electrons as far apart as possible, uh, it's about a 109.5 bond angle. And this is definitely a bond angle you would need to know. When you have a tetrahedral shape, you have a bond angle of, of a little over 109. So about 109.5. So anytime you have four attached, zero lone pairs on the center, the shape is going to be tetrahedral. Seesaw is another new shape here for AP. We still have four attached, uh, but now we have one lone pair on the center atom. So four attached to the center, one lone pair on the center is going to make this shape seesaw. The reason it's called seesaw is because it kind of looks 
like a seesaw. You could imagine kind of a person sitting here, a person sitting here, and it just kind of going back and forth, all right, based on the shape there. So again, it's going to have a bunch of different bond angles dep depending on which angle you're looking at. So the bond angles for this one are not as important because they're pretty common, uh, but you definitely need to know uh, that this is four attached, one lone pair on the center. It's going to be seesaw. So now we increased another lone pair on the center. We still have four atoms attached to the center, but now we have two lone pairs on the center. This is square planar. This would be nice and flat. Notice the word planar there. All the atoms are in the same plane. Uh, basically, this is what sometimes people think tetrahedral would look like, uh, but you can get them further apart by thinking in terms of three dimension. Because of the lone pairs on the center of this one, Going nice and flat keeps everything as far apart as possible. Again, pretty common bond angles. You could see that this would be 180 or 90, not something I would worry about too much, uh, but you should know that square planar, four attached, two lone pairs on the center atom is gonna be nice and flat here, all right? So if you were thinking about this in terms of uh, polarity here, notice just having lone pairs on the center is not enough to make something polar. All right. If you look at the center here of this atom, there are lone pairs and you might think, oh, well, lone pairs on the center means polar. Well, no, remember it all comes down to the shape. In this case, this is a symmetric shape. So this would be nonpolar. All right. Even though there's lone pairs on the center, the shape is not asymmetric. You need an asymmetric shape in order to be polar. And because this forms a nice flat planar shape, uh, the square planar molecules are all going to be uh, nonpolar here. All right, so you got to be careful with that. Remember, for an AP, uh, polarity is determined by the overall shape being asymmetric, not just lone pairs on the center. So anytime we have uh, four atoms attached, two lone pairs on the center, we're going to have square planar. So now we're up to the shapes that have five atoms attached. So trigonal bipyramidal is going to have five attached, zero lone pairs on the center. Uh, remember, the other atoms can have lone pairs on them, but when we're looking at the center to determine the shape here, the center itself has no lone pairs. And you can easily remember this one because of the tri is three, bi is two, so three plus two is five. All right, so five attached, zero lone pairs on the center, trigonal bipyramidal. Again, with the bond angles, has multiple bond angles here. These you could probably figure out, not something uh, that you would need to spend a lot of time memorizing for this one. So we're still at five attached, but now we have one lone pair on the center. This is forming the shape square pyramidal. Uh, basically, because of the lone pair on the center, it causes uh, the atoms on kind of the bottom part to kind of flatten out. Uh, so if you look at the shape here, you can see the bottom is completely square, all right? And it would sit nicely, nice and flat there, but then you do have this one atom coming out the top part. Uh, so that's the way these um, valence electrons get as far apart as possible. Again, multiple bond angles, so you don't really need to worry about this one too much either for the bond angles, but definitely no five attached, one lone pair on the center, that's gonna be square pyramidal. And the last shape you need to know, uh, we're finally getting six things attached here. So we have six atoms attached to the center, no lone pairs on the center. Remember, the center has no lone pairs. The other things attached to it can have lone pairs, but the center has no lone pairs, so that's gonna be octahedral here, all right? Typically, you know, the bond angle is gonna be 90 if you're comparing, uh, it's not a big deal that you you know focus on the bond angle for this one too much, uh, but definitely no six attached, zero lone pairs on the uh, center is going to be octahedral. And remember, the only way you could really get six attached here to a particular atom, because remember that would be 12 uh, electrons around the center, it's got to be one of those elements that can expand. For any of these, even the ones with five attached, in order to do that, they must be one of those elements that can expand their octet and take more, all right? So this is the last shape you need to know. Again, focus on some of those bond angles and definitely know uh, how many attached, how many lone on the center and be able to identify these shapes. Draw the dot structures and then you determine the shapes, uh, the molecular geometry from those dot structures. 
Electronic domains versus molecular geometry is something new here for AP. All right, we know about molecular geometry. We just went through uh, the molecular shapes of these molecules. Uh, the molecular geometry is used to describe the shape of the actual molecule itself. Electronic domains basically is focusing on the electron groups on the central atom, and it can help here with bond angle. Basically, electronic domains totally ignores electrons that are shared or lone pairs. It literally just counts everything attached to the center atom. And it doesn't matter if it's a lone pair of electrons or if it's an actual bond, that counts as something attached. So for example, let's look at water. We already know for water, water has a bent molecular geometry. It has two things attached to the center atom, two lone pairs on that center atom. Therefore, it's a bent molecular geometry or a molecular shape. But according to electronic domains, it only looks at how many things total are around that center atom. So we already know there's two atoms attached, but then there's two lone pairs. So that's a total of four things attached or four things around that atom. So it classifies it as a tetrahedral electron geometry. Okay, so it's almost like you consider um, Attached and lone pairs to be the exact same thing when you're doing electronic domains. So because there are two atoms attached to the center of the water molecule and two lone pairs, that's a total of four things. So therefore, you go to the shape that has four things attached and you totally ignore lone pairs. So it just becomes a tetrahedral electron domain or electron geometry. All right, so there's definitely a difference here and you gotta pay attention to what you're being asked. If you're asked for molecular geometry or molecular shape, you just based on how many things attached, how many lone pairs on the center. If you're doing electron domain, you literally just look at how many things are around that center atom and you count uh, atoms attached and pairs of electrons as being the exact same thing. So we'll look at another uh, slide here with this, but I think you'll see this is actually not that bad. As you can see here, there are a lot of different molecular geometries or molecular shapes. All right, so if you notice, all of these uh, names here could be potential molecular shapes or molecular geometry. But for electron domains, only these are your possible options. All right, because electron domains totally ignore lone pairs. So the only possible um, molecular shapes that could be electron domains are the ones that have zero lone pairs. So for example, if you have just two things around that atom, it's gonna be a linear electronic domain. If you have three things around that atom, it's gonna be a trigonal planar electron domain. Okay, so notice we did on the previous slide, uh, water. It has a bent shape in terms of its molecular shape because it has two attached, two lone pairs, but two attached, two lone pairs is a total of four electron regions. So that would make it a tetrahedral uh, electron domain. All right, so if you're asked here to do uh, electron domains, you literally just count um, lone pairs and attached as the exact same thing and you total up the total number of attached and lone pairs and it's going to be one of these possibilities. These are the only possibilities for electronic domains, but then you could have any of these for molecular shape. So you definitely need to understand the difference here. Molecular shape you're probably the most familiar with because we've done it. You just look at the center, count the number of uh, things attached, count the number of lone pairs on the center and you get your molecular shape. All right, the electronic domains though, you just count the uh, attached and lone as the exact same thing. You're only looking at attached only, and it can only be one of these possibilities uh, for your electronic uh, shape. All right, so definitely make sure you understand the difference between electronic domains and molecular shape. So we pretty much have covered all the different possible molecular shapes here in AP. Just realize, Anytime you have double or triple bonds in a molecule, they're often going to either give a linear shape uh, or some form of planar shape, all right? If you had three things attached with like a double bond, it could end up being a trigonal planar. 
Uh, but if there's more things involved with a double bond or something like that, you might just end up with a shape that's called planar because you have so many things kind of sticking off of it, but it's nice and flat. So that's why we would just call it planar. Uh, sometimes with a triple bond, depending on the number of uh, atoms in it, it might just end up being a linear molecule because these types of bonds don't allow for a lot of this bending and a lot of these shapes to form. So that's definitely something you need to watch out for and just be aware that typically double bonds, triple bonds, you're going to end up with either linear or some form of planar as uh, the shape of those molecules. Now we're going to talk a little bit here about orbital hybridization theory. You might remember uh, determining hybridization uh, for uh, molecules from honors, uh, but we're going to go through a little bit more of the theory here, maybe give you a little bit more of uh, an understanding about what this orbital hybridization theory is. Uh, but if you remember, basically, orbital hybridization theory combines information here about uh, molecular bonding and molecular shape. So it takes into account uh, like those uh, orbitals that are coming together when these things are going to bond, and it actually kind of ties this all together. So the easiest way we can kind of explain orbital hybridization theory uh, is kind of like this. Imagine you had a pug uh, combining with a beagle, you would end up with a puggle, all right? You're taking two things and you're fusing them together and you're getting a hybrid, all right? A lion and a tiger makes a liger. And it's the same kind of deal here. If you had one atom coming in to form a bond and it's bringing in an S orbital, uh, but another atom is coming in to form the bond and it's coming in with a P orbital, they might hybridize and fuse together here and you get a brand new SP hybrid orbital, all right? So this is kind of, you know, helping you understand this idea here that these orbitals, when they come together to form bonds, can actually fuse together and you form brand new orbitals. And that's what we're going to look at here as we continue on. The easiest way to understand orbital hybridization theory is to look at carbon, all right? If we look at the orbital diagram for carbon, we can see here that carbon only has two available electrons for bonding, all right? But we know that's not enough. Carbon typically forms four bonds. Well, if, if all that was happening was that carbon had two available electrons here to bond, it doesn't make sense that carbon can form four bonds. So there's obviously something going on here. And they knew that there had to be more to this story if carbon's able to form four bonds, but he only has two available electrons that aren't paired up here for bonding. All right, so we got to kind of figure out what's going on here. So the first thought here was that carbon just took one of its 2s electrons and kind of promoted it to the 2p. All right, we saw on the previous slide that this... Um, orbital here and the 2p was empty. So the first thought was, well, just one of the 2s electrons goes there and now carbon has four available electrons for bonding. And carbon likes to form four bonds. So they thought, oh, this is probably what actually happens. So now if we try to actually form a compound here, all right, let's bring in four hydrogen atoms uh, and try to form methane. Methane has a carbon atom and four hydrogens around it. So that's what we're going to look at here and see how this would actually bond if this is the correct theory here. If you're looking at this picture here, you want to imagine each of these is a hydrogen atom, all right, coming in to bond with the carbon. This is the carbon atom, and these are each of the four hydrogens coming in to form the bond. All right, remember, we said that the thought was that carbon promoted one of its 2s electrons to the empty 2p, and now it has four available electrons to form four bonds, one with each of the hydrogens. So if this is what happens, all right, three of the hydrogens here, this one, this one, and this one, would be combining a 1s with a 2p, the 1s from the hydrogen and the 2ps from the carbon. But one of the bonds would have a 1s from the hydrogen combining with a 2s electron of the carbon. What that means is basically three of the bonds would have the same energy, but one of the bonds would have a little bit less energy when the compound forms. But when methane forms, that's not what we see, all right? 
all the bonds, all the carbon hydrogen bonds in methane all have the same energy. So they know that this idea of carbon promoting one of its electrons in order to bond four times is not what's happening. Something else is taking place here. And this is where the idea of the orbital hybridization comes in. As I said, when they look at uh, the bond measurements here for methane, all four bonds are equal. So the only way they could explain how this happens is that the uh, atom must be doing some hybridization here. All right. So basically what happens is the S orbital is combining with the three P orbitals to form four equal sp3 hybridized orbitals all right so basically when carbon's going to bond here all right it does have four available electrons to bond but it's not one in the 2s and three in the 2p basically that 2s and that 2p hybridize to form four equal sp3 hybridized orbitals so when carbon's going to uh, combined with the hydrogens here, all four of the bonds are going to be equal because they're all this sp3 hybridized orbital. All right, basically, this new orbital has a little bit more energy than a 2s, but a little bit less energy than a 2p because it's kind of a combination here between the 2s and the 2p. All right, so this fully explains what happens when um, carbon is going to bond to the four hydrogens to form methane. This is the only way it works. It gives you four equal bonds, all right? So you have to understand that when these atoms are actually going to bond here, uh, these uh, orbitals actually hybridize, fuse together, and you get this new hybridized orbital that's going to be involved in the bonds. This picture is kind of showing you the energy here. So if you look here, this is showing you where the energy of a 2s would be. P's are always a little bit higher, so that would be where the energy of the 2p is. Uh, but when they hybridize and form these sp3 hybrid orbitals, you can see here the energy of all four of those hybrid orbitals is kind of in between the energy of the 2s and the 2p. And if you look down here in actual kind of picture form, uh, here is your s orbital. It's spherical. Here are your three p orbitals remember they are dumbbells and then when they fuse and form this sp3 hybridized orbital you can see this one energy wise is kind of in between the s and the p so what does all this mean for us for bonding well the idea is when these covalent bonds are going to form all right these atomic orbitals are coming together they're going to overlap and they're gonna sometimes fuse together to form these new hybrid orbitals that are gonna be involved with the bonding. So sometimes you have S, P, and D orbitals kind of fusing together here to form these new hybrid orbitals uh, when the bonding takes place. And that's why you will have to know uh, what hybridization a particular bond or molecule has. And, uh, when we're doing these, you have to be able to identify that. So if we're just looking at a quick example here, uh, we have BEF2. BE is bringing in kind of an S orbital, if you want to think about it like that. Uh, fluorine's coming in with the P orbitals. They're going to hybridize here, and they're going to give us brand new SP hybridized orbitals. It's no longer an S. It's no longer a P. It's a brand new SP hybrid orbital. All right, and that's what actually happens when these uh, atoms come together to form their bond. All right, so we gotta talk more about these actual hybridizations and being able to identify them. If you remember from honors here, these are the hybridizations that exist, all right? So you basically just have to uh, look at a dot structure. So if you're trying to determine a hybridization, look at the dot structure and count how many things are attached to the center. If you only have two things attached to the center, it's going to be SP hybridized. Remember, there's an easy way to remember this. All right, two things attached. You have one S plus one P. One plus one is two. All right. If you have three things attached here, 
all right, you're going to have SP2 hybridization. 1S, 2Ps, that's your 3, so it's going to be SP2. Four things attached, all right, would be SP3. If you have five things attached to the center, it's going to be SP3D. And if you have six things attached, it's going to be SP3D2. Again, 1S, 3Ps is 4, plus 2Ds is going to be 6 total. Uh, the only difference here for AP is that you have to count lone pairs as an attached group as well. So it's kind of like you're using those electron domains here, all right? So if you are looking at a particular atom, because you don't have to do this for the entire molecule, you could just look at a particular atom. If you look at the atom and count how many things are around that atom, that will determine your hybridization. A lone pair counts, in this case, as a attached, if you will. So if you're doing this and you see a lone pair on a particular atom and you're trying to determine the hybridization, you have to count that lone pair as an attached group as well. All right. So you definitely need to be able to do these hybridizations and be able to quickly identify them. Don't forget here that when you have multiple bond hybridizations, typically they, they default to specific hybridization. Uh, if you have all single bonds, just count the number of things attached. Remember, lone pairs here count as an attached group, and you can determine the hybridization just like we uh, saw on the previous slide. Typically, if you have a double bond involved, uh, it's going to be sp2 hybridization. But again, you can kind of count here and see, but typically it's going to be an sp2 hybridization. And if you have a triple bond involved, typically it's going to be sp. And people might say, well, how do you know or how is that going to work that this is going to be uh, SP here? Well, think about it. If you had a triple bond, all right, let's just do a quick example. If you had carbon triple bonded to another carbon here and you wanted to know the hybridization on this carbon, well, if you count the number of things attached to that carbon, well, it's going to have one hydrogen attached to it and one carbon. So I know that that's a triple bond there, but it still only has one carbon attached and one hydrogen for a total of two. So one and one is two. So it makes sense that it's SP hybridization here because one and one make two. All right. So this is just basically kind of if you looked at it the same way as we did before, you would get to the same hybridization. But sometimes it's helpful just to realize uh, if you see the triple bond involved, it's probably going to be. Uh, SP hybridized, and if you see a double bond involved, it's probably going to be SP2. So it's just something to pay attention to and watch out for. So if I asked you to do the hybridization here for a particular example, so if I ask you to do this for CH4, all right, you don't just guess. You have to draw a dot structure. Even if it doesn't tell you to draw a dot structure, you have to draw a dot structure. So you have to go through your steps. First thing I do is total up valence electrons. So Carbon is the first element. There are four valence electrons for each carbon, times one carbon in my um, compound here. Plus, there's one valence electron for each hydrogen, times there are four hydrogens in my formula. So when I total this up, I have eight total valence electrons available. Okay, so carbons or nitrogens go in the center. All right, so I have a carbon, so he's going to be the center. Whatever's left goes around him. So I have four hydrogens. I'm going to place them evenly around the center. Whoever's next to the center has to share at least a pair with the center. Okay, so I'm going to show my covalent bonding here, and then I have to make everybody happy. If you look at this picture, carbon has eight around him, hydrogen, each hydrogen has two. Okay, everybody's happy when I total it up, it equals eight electrons. So this is the dot structure for CH4. Okay, so now I literally count to determine the hybridization, okay? So I say, how many things are attached, all right? So there are four things attached to the center. Obviously, there are zero lone pairs on the center as well, all right? So you could use this to determine um, the actual molecular shape here. This would be tetrahedral, all right? Four attached, zero lone pairs on the center is the definition of tetrahedral shape, all right? But if you want to do the hybridization, there are four attached to the center. Okay, so if there are four attached, all right, your hybridization for this molecule will be sp3. Three p's plus one f, one s gives you your four. 
All right. So that's how you determine hybridization. Draw the dot structure, look at the center, count how many things are the center, and make sure um, when you give the hybridization, the superscripts essentially add up to the number attached. So now what if I wanted to do the hybridization here for SF6? Same deal. All right. When I want to do a hybridization or I want to do a shape, I have to draw the dot structure. So uh, there are six valence electrons for each sulfur, times there's one sulfur here, plus there are seven valence electrons for each fluorine, times six fluorine, all right? So when I total this up, I have 48 valence electrons here. So that means I need 48 dots in my picture uh, when I do this dot structure, all right? So carbons or nitrogens in the center, there are none. So whatever atom there's less of goes in your center. So the sulfur is going to be my center. Whatever's left has to go around him. There are six fluorines left. So immediately I know that sulfur is going to need to be able to expand because that's the only way he could take six fluorines here. Okay, so you put your six fluorine around your sulfur. Whoever's next to the center has to share at least a pair with the center. And these bigger ones here gets a little bit tougher to kind of show this correctly without getting the uh, dots all bunched up, but do the best there. Uh, that you can. So uh, whoever's next to your center shares at least a pair at the center, and now you make everybody happy. Well, right now, sulfur is good. He's actually over happy. He's got uh, 12 electrons. He's expanding here. Uh, but each fluorine only has two. So each fluorine needs six more, okay, valence electrons. So I'm going to make every fluorine happy. Remember, if you're wrong, you'll figure it out in a second. Again, it's very easy here to, you know, mix up which electrons go with which, so be very careful, all right? So I gave each fluorine the number of electrons he needs. Each fluorine needs eight. When I total up my valence electrons, now everybody's happy, and I hit 48. So this would be the dot structure here for um, SF6. So now if I want to do the shape or the hybridization, okay, I literally look at the center and I count. So the sulfur is the center. There are six attached to the center, and there are no lone pairs on the center. The fluorines have lone pairs, but the center, the sulfur, does not have any lone pairs. All right? So by definition for shape, okay, this would be octahedral here, okay? Because there are six attached, zero lone pairs, all right? So that would be the definition of octahedral. Now, if you want to do hybridization, all right, your superscripts here for your hybridization have to add up to six. There are six attached. So the hybridization for this is going to be S, P3, D, 2. All right, one S plus three P's plus two D's gives you six. Now let's determine the hybridization here for X, E, F, 4. So I already went through and drew the dot structure here for this molecule. Uh, you can see here, uh, that you do have extra lone pairs on the center atom because you needed to have 36 uh, electrons total here. So when we analyze this center atom, notice we have a total of four atoms attached, all right, to the center, but we also have two lone pairs on the center. So remember, when you're trying to determine hybridization, lone pairs count as kind of a thing attached. So we actually have a total here of six things attached or around the center atom. So when we're determining hybridization, those lone pairs count as something attached and they have to be used here uh, when you're determining that hybridization. So the hybridization of this uh, molecule would be SP3D2. 1s plus 3ps plus 2ds gives you your six total attached. So just remember here that when you're doing the hybridization for a particular atom, you do need to count those lone pairs as something attached here. All right. So that's how you would do the hybridization for any uh, atom or molecule. You need to draw the dot structure and analyze the particular atom you're looking at. Real quick, I just want to mention uh, sigma and pi bonds here. So sigma bonds are when the electrons are located around the center axis of the bond. So if you look here in this picture, if these are your two elements here that are sharing electrons, 
if it was a sigma bond, the electrons would be right there in between um, the two atoms. Okay, so a sigma bond is when the electrons are literally being shared right between the two atoms. So all single bonds are sigma bonds. Pi bonds, on the other hand, are when the electrons are actually located above and below um, the axis here of the bond. So you don't need to know too much about identifying these in a picture per se, but you need to know the information about how many sigma and how many pi bonds there could be. So uh, the only time you see pi bonds are when you have double or triple bonds, okay? By default, every bond has a sigma bond in it, okay? So if you have a double bond, there's going to be a sigma bond is one of the bonds. The other bond is going to be your pi bond. So a double bond has to have two bonds. It has to have one sigma, so then the other bond is a pi. A triple bond, okay, is going to have to have one sigma because every bond has a sigma bond. And then the other two bonds are going to be pi bonds, okay? So if you were doing this, all right, how could this be asked, all right? They could give you a particular structure and just ask how many sigma, how many pi bonds are in it. So for example, if you were given, okay, CH4 here, okay, I could ask how many sigma bonds, how many pi bonds are in this, all right? Well, anytime you have a single bond, all right, each of these bonds here are a single covalent bond. That's why they're just showing as a single line, all right? Those would all be sig sigma bonds. All right, so in this particular picture here, this would have four sigma bonds. Well, how many pi bonds are there? Well, none. You would not see pi bonds until you get to double or triple bonds, okay? So if I did another example here, if I did say this, and I said how many sigma, how many pi bonds here, all right? So I know that Every single bond is a sigma bond, so there would be one sigma, two sigma, but then in this triple bond, there's also one sigma as well. So this would have three sigma bonds, but then two pi bonds, okay, from the triple bond, all right? So that's what you would have to be able to do here with sigma and pi bonds. You have to be able to say how many there would be by looking at a uh, dot structure or a structural formula.